Well, good morning, everyone, and welcome. Thank you. Well, you go ahead and if you're able, stand. We're going to start our time together responding to God for who he is and what he's done for us. So let's invite his Holy Spirit to speak, to fall afresh on us as we sing these words together this morning.
Thank you, Jesus.
Jesus, what a promise for us to hold on to. That your love always, always surrounds us. God, the depths of your mercy are so far beyond what we can comprehend or even begin to imagine. Just how merciful and kind and compassionate you always long to be towards us. God, your love always, always surrounds us, even when we're unaware of it, even when we lose sight of it. So God, would you remind us of that reality today? May we rest in that reality today. Jesus, we love you so much. It's in your name we pray, amen. You can have a seat. All right, welcome everybody. Can you give it up to the band? Thank them for leading us this morning. Incredible, so grateful for them. Um, well, hey, uh, if we have not had a chance to meet, my name is Justin. I have the privilege of being on the team here and so glad that you are part of today, whether you're here in person or tuning in online. Just want you to know that you're welcome here and uh, we're excited that whenever you're ready to take a next step, there are opportunities all around Kensington to get involved. And so you can always stop by the hub out in the lobby uh, to ask a few questions, get connected, hear about some of the upcoming events and activities that are available to you. Uh, I'm gonna share a few of those just this morning, just to let you know, maybe there's something uh, for you in, in these next couple announcements that you're like, that's the next step that I, I would be interested in or would like to take uh, an opportunity to, to experience. One of those is today for our young adults in the room. Uh, we've been doing a, a young adults lunch where we gather at the Ferndale Project. We'd love for you to join Tatiana and some of the other young adults in our community as they're just hosting lunch, gathering together, connecting. Uh, out of that, there are small groups that launch community activities and opportunities. So if you're interested in that, just show up at the Ferndale Project today. They'd love to meet with you, gather with you. I think it's starting at 1145, so after service, head on over there, and it'll be a great opportunity to connect. Uh, one of the other things that is coming up that is really near and dear to my heart, uh, many of you know my good friend, Dr. Eric Moore. He teaches here on a regular basis. Uh, he's an incredible friend to a Kensington. He's been around here for many, many years. Uh, we have been uh, taking a unique opportunity to gather our two communities together uh, for worship nights periodically throughout the year, and we're doing that for a potluck and a worship night in, uh, in August, August 22nd, and we'd love for you to join us. It's going to be a time for our two churches to come together. Uh, we'll have some food. We'll hang out in the parking lot, party in the parking lot kind of style. And then we'll go into their worship center and, and be able to have a time of encouragement, a time of worship, a time of connection. We'd love for you to join us on that. You can show up with uh, a food or a drink to pass, or you can just show up and we'd love for you to be there. You can see some details and even uh, register to let us know you're coming as we're planning on food for our two communities that are gathering together. And then one other thing is, how many of you are, uh, especially with school coming, who's experiencing the stress? Anybody? The calendaring, it's like a matrix. I know, Steve, you're looking for all the grandkids' games that you got to go to. I know you're staying engaged. I, I see you. Um, so with that, one of the things that a friend of ours is offering is a holy yoga experience for all the ladies in the room. Uh, one of our friends is a big part of holy yoga here in Detroit, and she's created an experience for a gathering to happen on the 24th. She loved to be able to host it alongside of Kensington. would love for you to uh, maybe go out and, and use this as a great opportunity of experience, connection, maybe a reset as you head into the fall. And if you don't have an excuse, just show up anyways. It'll be a great reason just to do that. Uh, so those are a few of the announcements. Well, one of the things that we've been doing here uh, throughout this series called Lessons from the Lake, you know, kind of taking the Michigan theme of lakes. I, our family just got back from vacation. I went into Lake Superior for the first time. Y'all, it's cold but beautiful. Oh my goodness. So anyways, we've been, we've been having fun with our resident uh, joking influencer, our friend Tyler, who's been inspiring us. I don't know if any of you tried the jalapeno s'more that he suggested last week, but let's see what Tyler has in store for us today. Hey everyone. Welcome to Lessons from the Lake. Today's video is brought to you by Man camp, or man's camp, man camp. Today's lesson is gonna be about how to forage for your own food. Follow me. First, you need to find a woods. Then you're gonna look for some soil. And here we have found some mushrooms. Get in here, take a look at these. You got a white one here. 
That's too clean. You see, that's nature's way of trying to trick you. You can't touch that one. You gotta go in for the nice brown, dirty one. Let's get in here. Now pluck it right out of the soil. See that? That's how you know it's safe, that nice brown, chocolatey color. Then you just get in there, get some. Then you're starting to chew it. And know. Uh, oh. They're a little spicier than the last. I gotta sit down. Can you give it up for Tyler and his influence? Amazing. We're like, we seriously need to put this caption, do not try this at home, just for anybody who had a thought. Anyways, uh, there's no real point to that other than to tell you that man camp's happening uh, October 11th through 13th where you don't have to forage for your own food. We provide it. Uh, so put that on your calendar, men. It's our retreat in the fall. We'd love for you to check that out. Uh, but anyways, before we jump into today's message, we actually have our founding pastor, Steve Andrews, with us. Give it up for Steve. Steve, you're not supposed to shout the loudest for yourself. That's, uh, that's not what you're supposed to do. Before he comes up, why don't you stand up, say hello to somebody around you, and ask him, did they watch Triple Espresso Uni United States women's team pull off the incredible win? All right. Good morning, everybody. Good morning. What a, uh, Tyler Verrier is hilarious. I'm, I'm sorry, but that was, that was outrageous, wasn't it? Uh, please, please do not mess with mushrooms. <laughs> anyway, uh, how many of you are totally into the Olympics? Anybody? Let me see a show of hands. Okay, I think of all the things, it, it does, it's so inspiring to see people who have like taken on a life purpose and then they give themselves fully to it. It's just been so awesome. But I got to tell you, I can't believe Justin's talking about the women's soccer. It was amazing. It was. It was amazing. Let's talk about Steph Curry, please, please. Uh, so anyway, I, I've really had fun and I'm kind of, I was talking to Charles Day earlier. I'm kind of depressed that it's coming to an end today. So, but it's been super fun to watch and it actually fits with, the theme that we're, that we're on today in this series by the lake. And um, a lot of you know that Justin and I lead uh, men trips together to Israel. And we've had some of the most incredible moments in my life, at least, on the lake, experiencing Jesus. And realizing that Jesus came to this little tiny provincial area of northern Israel, the Sea of Galilee. It's not, it's not a sea. It's, a, it's, a, it's a just a decent size freshwater lake, not even particularly noticeable on Michigan terms, but it was where God decided to, to let himself be known, Jesus, uh, as God in human form. That's what we believe. And it was incredible what he did and as he prepared this journey. But one of the things that I love about this is that the lake is where he called his first disciples, right? If you grew up in Sunday school, you know this. Uh, can anybody name me the first four? Peter, Andrew, James, and John, the four uh, fishermen. They were probably cousins related. Jesus probably knew them before he called them. But here's the, here's the message I wanted, the journey I want to take us on for the next few minutes. Did you ever start something with high hopes? Like were you ever called out of the mundane kind of flow of your life to something that really had great promise and then to see it all come crashing down around you. Has that ever happened? You ever dreamed of doing something with your life and then 
and then it just doesn't turn out. The question is, how did you respond? Were you tempted or did you go back to old destructive behaviors? Did you turn on God or others in disappointment? Because we're going to look at Peter today specifically, but really it's the journey of the disciples. But Peter was called to something phenomenal. And when it all broke apart, he decided to kind of just run back towards his old way of living. And I thought, we've all done that. It's interesting, during COVID, we had reports from all of our Celebrate Recovery partners that so many people during the quarantine were running back to their old addictive patterns because they found themselves isolated and discouraged, and it's easy to do that. And so today, I want, I want to leave here uh, in, in about three hours when I'm done with this message, and I want you to say, I'm moving forward with the things God's called me to in my life. Because as Peter was a fisherman by trade, it was a hard job, it was dirty and dangerous, it had no social esteem. They were constantly mending nets, cleaning fish, repairing boats, battling the elements, burned raw by the sun. And then Jesus finds them. And Jesus turns their life completely upside down. And I thought, it's exactly what Jesus does today. He comes to every one of you. He comes to me. And he says, hey, I've got more for your life. Wherever you are, I've got a vision for your life to be so much richer, so much more meaningful, so much more purposeful than you ever imagined. But along the way, even if you answer yes to that call from Jesus, it's easy to get discouraged, to retreat, to fail, to fall back into old ways that don't take me and take you anywhere good. So for those of you who don't know the story, let me just summarize the first part. When Jesus first calls the disciples in Matthew chapter four, he says, come follow me and I will send you out to fish for people. And it says at once they left their nets and followed him. It says for um, James and his brother John, they were mending their nets. This word mend means to repair what is broken, to make complete so that you could go out and fish. And Jesus shows up and he says, no, no, now you're going you're gonna, to you're gonna make nets to capture people, to communicate the love of God, to communicate that the kingdom of God has come. And that there's a whole new way of living and a whole new set of values based on, on, on Jesus as the center of the kingdom. And it says, and they left everything to follow. This word follow is so powerful. I love it. It means simply this. It means to accompany him. Jesus said, follow me. It means just join in the adventure. I think back to, uh, I grew up with a dad that was highly adventurous. Hunting, fishing, golf. My dad was a uh, uh, my dad was the number one, number one uh, golfer on the University of Tennessee golf team, 1940 and 41. He was, uh, he was a great tennis player. He was runner-up, Memphis High School champ in tennis. The question is, what happened to me athletically? That's what, <laughs> that's what I'd like to know. But everywhere my dad went, it was always an adventure. If you were going hunting and dad was going to get in the, we were duck hunting and dad would get in the little duck boat, duck boat to go somewhere. Everybody wanted to go with him. They wanted to accompany him because they knew something fun was going to happen, something adventurous, and hopefully you wouldn't end up in jail as a result. This is what Jesus communicated to the disciples. They left everything and they followed, they accompanied. It's really to say they were going to go wherever Jesus was going to lead them. He was going to go first, they were going to follow along. And not just to fish, but to reach people. Not just to make a living, but to change their country and to bless the world and to see people come to a relationship with the living God. So Jesus finds them working on their nets. And then all of a sudden, they're off doing the most unbelievable things, watching Jesus perform miracles, thousands and thousands of people following him. And it looks so exciting. And then in, in the end, you know what happens, right? What happens? It all comes crashing down. Jesus is arrested in Jerusalem. He actually tells them, I'm going to Jerusalem and I'm going to be arrested. And in the end, they all run away. Jesus is tortured and executed. 
And then they're hiding in fear of their own lives. But then there's news of the resurrection and Jesus appears in their midst to show himself. But here's what we're not sure about. We're not sure exactly how how Peter and Jesus really connected. Because we know Jesus saw the, we know that Peter saw the risen Jesus a couple of times, but, but we reach this interesting moment in the journey in John chapter 21, where, where Jesus tells the disciples, go, go into Galilee, I'm gonna meet you there. And Peter goes and they're waiting for Jesus to show up. And what I'm gonna share with you in the next 20 minutes, seriously, is the lessons from Peter that have probably been as formative in my own life as any lessons that I've ever learned about my own self, my life, and about Jesus Christ. And so are you ready for these? I hope some of you are going to have a phone to take a picture of these lessons because I really think they'll make a difference in this, in this coming season of your life. Here's what Peter has taught me over the years of my life that we're going to see in this story. Number one, failure is not the end. Fear of failure is not the end. Uh, excuse me, failure is not the end. And fear of failure doesn't need to stop us. This is something that I just, I look around and I see it everywhere. People are frozen because they're af- afraid to take, take the risk. It's really interesting. I'm going to just one illustration on the Olympics. A lot of criticism of the USA basketball team for not beating teams by by larger margins. But think of yourself as a USA all-world basketball player. And the only positive is not to fail. Like if you win, you don't get it, you get no credit. And when they win, it's such a relief. And I thought, but they didn't let fear of failure stop them. Fear of embarrassment, of trying and not succeeding. Is there, is there something you've wanted to do? But you thought, gosh, if I fail, I'm a laughing stock. I'll look so stupid if I do this. Everyone has this. And it's not just young people with dreams. It's old people that, that as you get older, you're like, man, I should step out and really do something with these remaining years of my life. You go, well, I, I, I don't know. Or I could just revert back to being comfortable. Fear of failure. Don't let it stop you, okay? Did anybody take a picture of that one? Okay, nobody. Great. All right. (laughs) Let's go to number two. So here, let me get to the scripture. It says, afterwards, Jesus appeared to his disciples by the Sea of Galilee. It happened this way. Simon Peter, Thomas, also known as Didymus. Remember, Thomas had already seen Jesus in Jerusalem, put his hand in his side, touched the nail, the nail wounds in his hands. And Nathaniel from Cana and Galilee, the sons of Zebedee, that's James and John, two other disciples were together. I'm going out to fish, Simon Peter told them. And they said, we'll go with you. So here's the scene. They're waiting for Jesus to show up. They've already seen him, but they don't know what they're supposed to do. And they hate waiting. Typical guys. And he says, I'm going to go fish. Because, right, fishing is the one thing that's familiar to him. But it's funny, if you, read, if you read the accounts of all the Gospels, he's kind of a bad fisherman. Every time Jesus shows up, he hasn't caught anything. <laughs> so it says they went out and got in the boat, but that night they caught nothing. They would, normally they'd cast their nets and fish in the night. It says early in the morning, Jesus stood on the shore. By the way, the first time Jesus, uh, one of the first times that Jesus called them, they had fished all night. Remember, Jesus had the crowds following him, and, and uh, he, he said, can I get in your boat so I can speak to the people from the water because the crowds are just pressing down on him. And it's afterwards Jesus says, throw out your nets. And they're like, Lord, you know, you're cool, but you don't know anything about fishing. We fished all night, caught nothing. Jesus says, just throw it. And they catch this gigantic catch of fish, right? So that's already happened once. So Jesus is, is uh, on the shore, and he calls out and says, have you any fish? You see, this is the moment where you realize the Bible's funny. You need to laugh. <laughs> have you caught any fish? Of course you haven't. You're a bunch of lousy, stinking fishermen. <laughs> they said, no. He said, throw your net on the right side of the boat, and you'll find some. And this time they didn't argue with him. And when they did, 
they were unable to haul the net in because of the large number of fish. And then the disciple whom Jesus loved, that was John, said to Peter, it's the Lord. Oh, man. Duh. We've got, we've got the biggest haul of fish ever. This is the second time it's happened. I think it's Jesus on the shore. Second point. It's a really big one. This time I expect to double the number of people that did not take a picture last time. In crisis, we can retreat to the familiar and, st and still Jesus meets us there. And still Jesus meets us there. This is the amazing thing to me. We can retreat, but Jesus will still find us. Sometimes he'll come and he'll find us in, in an absolute pity party or he'll find us in filth and degradation, or he'll, or he'll find us where we have made choices that fill us with such shame that we have done what we've done. And still he comes and finds us. He searches us out. It's amazing. If you don't believe me, just read the Bible. Adam and Eve in the garden, right? They totally rebel against God. What does God do? What does he do, guys? He comes and finds us. I love this. I love how he comes and finds us along the way. Have you ever had somebody you love run away from you? Like totally, totally disconnect? Have you ever run away from somebody where you've snubbed your nose at somebody and you mistreated them and all of a sudden they come and find you? crazy. It's crazy joy when it happens. So I just want to say, if you've retreated to the familiar, a very good friend from this campus, was a big, big part of Kensington through the years, that when he shared to me that he was no longer going to follow Jesus after us serving together for 20 years, all I could remember was Jesus went to the shore he went to find him on the lake after fishing all night. We can retreat to what's familiar, but Jesus will come and find you. Oh, my goodness. I just saw on my prompter, Steve, you forgot the offering. That's never happened before. So, ushers, if you... Do you know, one day I'm just not going to be asked to come back. That'll be it. So, ushers, come on down. I want to celebrate God's faithfulness. For those of you that are partnering with us, there should be a, a picture on the screen behind me of how to give, but there's so many ways. Uh, a lot of us do text. A lot of us do uh, regular uh, scheduled giving, which makes a huge difference. And um, I, I want to share with you a cool story in a minute of one of our new partners in missions, uh, which I'll get to in a couple of minutes. But thank you, all of you that are learning to, to give of yourself. And I, I'm actually thinking of all the years that no one has ever come to me and said, man, I'm sorry for giving too much and sacrificing too much, serving too much. I, maybe it's happened. Maybe one of you wants to tell me that, but it's up to this point, 34 years here, it's never, never happened. It's pretty awesome, God's faithfulness. Okay, so you ready? Here's the next section of the scripture. So Simon Peter uh, hears from John, that it's the Lord. And it says, as soon as Simon Peter heard him say, it is the Lord, this is one of the greatest moments in the Bible to me. He wrapped his outer garment around him, for he had taken it off and jumped into the water. Which I'm still trying to understand all these years later. Because normally when you jump in the water, you take your outer garment off, I think. And so anyway, he jumps and he goes to connect with Jesus. And to me, this is unbelievable because Peter has failed Jesus, right? He denies Jesus. He denies Jesus with foul language. He doesn't even know him. And Jesus goes to the cross and he's crushed and he's rejected, he's mocked. And the whole time, Peter's like just swearing profanities. He doesn't know who Jesus is. After all this time together, can't imagine what he must have felt. But then again, he says, he hears it the Lord. And what does he do? He puts his garment on and he leaps into the water. It says the other disciples followed in the boat, 
towing the net full of fish. Leave it to Peter or leave them to do all the work. For they were not far from shore, about 100 yards. When they landed, they saw a fire of burning coals. There were fish on it and some bread. And Jesus said to them, bring some of the fish you've caught. So Simon Peter climbed back into the boat and dragged the net ashore. It was full of large fish, 153. But even with so many, the net was not torn. And Jesus said to them, come and have breakfast. And none of the disciples dared ask him, who are you? They knew it was the Lord. I don't know why this means so much to me, but you've got to understand that when you invite someone to your table, to a meal you've prepared, it's one of the most powerful expressions of, I care about you. I'm opening up my life to you. This is an unbelievable moment when we invite people to our table and Jesus invites us to his. My third point is this, and again, I just, I, I, I just hope you'll remember this. I talked about in crisis, we can retreat to the familiar. Jesus still comes to us. He still meets us there. Point number three that we learn from Peter's life is that when Jesus comes to you, you can hide in shame or stand in disbelief or you can leap towards him again. Like you can move towards him again. This is why I love Peter. I admire him so much because he still is leaping. He's still moving towards Jesus. He's still moving toward, even though he's been so broken, he sees this Jesus and he leaps towards him. You know what? Today, if one person here or watching on stream, we finish this hour together and you go, I'm going to leap towards Jesus. I'm going to, I'm going to follow Jesus. I'm going to be receptive. As we talked about that in this series multiple times, to be our hearts like the good soil, to be receptive to the movement of the Holy Spirit, that God's love coming to us and we can, we can hide in shame or we can stand off in disbelief or just be, or in cynicism which is such a mark of this time in history, or we can move, we can leap towards Jesus. Just love that. Fourth principle. We finish this story. It says, Jesus came and took the bread that he had prepared, right, and gave it to them, and he did the same with the fish. This was now the third time Jesus appeared to his disciples. So it was the third time Think about this, Peter. You always think about the Peter connections, but three denials, this is the third time Peter's showing, Jesus showing up to Peter and he's like, Peter, okay, it's three, it's three enough. I've showed up in your life. And, and it, uh, this was after he was raised from the dead. And when he had finished eating, he said to Simon Peter, some of you may, will know this part maybe, but he says, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? Yes, Lord, he said, you know that I love you. And Jesus said, feed my lambs. Now, there's a lot of, lot of language depth in this. It's really interesting. There's uh, some of you that know your Bible, know that Jesus was using the word agape, which was this really powerful form of God's love that is used to describe. And, and he says, Peter, do you love me more than these? Do you love me with that utter total devotion? And Peter uses a different word. He can't use that word. Why? Because Peter has spent his whole, whole life, at least in my opinion, over-promising and under-delivering, right? He said, man, I am all in. Nothing's going to turn me away, right? And then at, the, at some of the first signs of real, real danger, Peter abandons Jesus. But then Jesus says, feed my lambs. You know what it means? It means he's like, he's like saying, Peter, you're still in the game. You're, you still have a purpose. Like your failure did not disqualify you from following me in life. Now, it's interesting. In our culture, it's very interesting. I would describe uh, the modern culture of the, tw of the 2020s to be everything is allowable, but nothing is forgiven. Right? You make a mistake, you make a mistake, man, you are toast. There's this incredible 
spirit of freedom to be whatever you want, but this powerful, powerful spirit of condemnation that we're ready to condemn people when they feel. But Jesus is coming saying, I don't condemn you. This is why later the apostle Paul is going to write, for we are not under God's condemnation. Right? This is where John is going to has already written as he writes the story of the gospel where Jesus says, I did not come to condemn the world, but to save the world. I came to set people free. Again, twice, second time, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Again, that word agape, it's a powerful word. And Peter again says, Lord, yeah. And, and, and I would say, in, in my opinion as I look at this, I would say, it's almost like saying, hey, do you love me with all your heart? And, and Peter's like, Lord, I'm really fond of you. I do, I do really care about you, but I'm almost afraid to say how much. And then Jesus says, take care of my sheep. He's saying, you have a purpose. And the third time he said to him, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Peter was hurt because Jesus asked him the third time, do you love me? He said, Lord, you know all things. You know that I love you. And Jesus said, feed my sheep. He said, don't revert to the past, go forward into the future and live the life that I called you to live. And I thought there are a lot of us today, I'll bet you, all over Kensington and all over, the, all over the Christian world and just people in general that are living in the mud puddles of life and they're just stuck there. And guess where Jesus shows up? He shows up right in the puddle. He just, he gets right down in there with you. Fish, 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 you know. He does. He meets us right in that place and he says, live your purpose. Don't get, don't get caught by complacence. Don't get caught by success. Don't get trapped by affluence. Don't get discouraged by failure. Don't let broken relationships end your sense of movement that Christ can do something great in your life. I'm here. I'm in the puddle with you, and I'm going to get up, and I'm going to walk out of this puddle with you into a life of adventure. And think about the adventure Almost done here. He says, very truly, I tell you, when you were younger, you dressed yourself and went where you wanted, but when you were old, you'll stretch out your hands and someone else will dress you and lead you where you don't want to go. And Jesus said this to indicate the kind of death by which Peter would glorify God. Then he said to him, follow me. He said, accompany me. He says, listen, I've got an adventure for you. And guess where it's going to lead? It's going to lead to execution. It's going to end horribly but you're going to follow me and I'm going to be with you every step of the way. What an, what an invitation. Who could say no to that? Peter couldn't because he realized that Jesus was the only answer to the dreams and the hopes of his life. That's what it means to follow him. My fourth principle is this. Jesus' love is greater than my failure. And my failure doesn't stop Jesus from calling me to a life of caring for people the way Jesus cares for people. Good, thank you for the, hun the thousands of you that are taking pictures of this great thing. I want you to remember that, uh, you know what, when we get to the end, you can take one picture. I didn't think of that. Okay. <laughs> Genius. But as you read this story, you can feel Peter's hesitation and his humiliation. Yet he wants, he wants to have a purpose. I got a chance to just do um, the most recent Kensington mission trip to uh, Navajo Nation. We were in northern Arizona in, the, in Black Mesa area, which is about an hour and a half northeast of Flagstaff. And we got to work with uh, uh, Pastor J.R. and his son, who are, uh, Al, who are doing such a great job. I took a picture of them uh, we have a picture of that. It was beautiful country. Black Mesas, uh, the church and the outposts where they deliver resources to the Navajo people all over that region. It's about 7,300 feet. And that, that's up kind of at one of the overlooks. Absolutely beautiful. And Pastor JR is the old guy on the right. That's his son, Al. Uh, Al's son, um, just a super neat kid, uh, had a liver transplant at age one. And it's, and it's really doing well. But these guys are giving their lives. They are living lives of true purpose and meaning. And I love the fact that failure doesn't stop Jesus from calling people to a life of incredible purpose. 
Pastor J.R. was a fall down drunk for decades through his young life. And kind of in middle age, he came to Christ, had an incredible transformation, and he is known all over that region as a man that loves Jesus and loves people. His son, uh, Al, comes from in a, is in a similar story, a similar journey. Obviously, we know indigenous peoples in, in America have a tremendous challenge with alcohol. It's, a, it's an incredible problem for them, and Al came out of that. Al has been serving, kind of leading the distribution of food that they do out of that. And here's what's amazing. They're trying, I don't have a picture of it in front to show you, but they're building a big warehouse that's uh, is certainly as big as the stage, including behind the curtains. And uh, they've been working on that, doing it piecemeal because they don't have enough money to finish it. And they've been doing it piece by piece. And Al has been leading the construction on that. Al has moved into, into an old, old house. It's over 100 years old on this property. And his own house has remained completely undeveloped, unworked on for about a year and a half because he's trying to get this building done so they can get more food to distribute to the Navajo people. In other words, they're living lives of purpose. And the wasted and the destructive years did not stop them from living the life that Jesus called them to live. And so I just thought, I wanted to share that with you today because I thought some of you are going to go, uh, Andrews, you don't know me. You don't know the mistakes I've made. You don't know, the, you don't know my bad habits. Listen, I do. I don't know what yours are, but I, I know they're there. And I know that Jesus is saying, listen, I just got a richness of life for you. Follow me, accompany me. And I just, and I am here always to bear witness to you. I remember when I was 12 years old and my mom and dad said, hey, uh, we're, we're gonna leave uh, our home for a year. We're gonna go to Africa. Uh, dad's, dad's gonna run a mission hospital. We're gonna go on this adventure with God. And I just remember at that point, that was 56 years ago. People said, you're crazy, Chubby Andrews, you're nuts, you're gonna lose your medical practice. What are you doing following? But mom and dad were like, no, we're gonna accompany Jesus. And so we go, we had the most unbelievable year, right? It was a total transformational year. Changed everything about my life. Because when you follow Jesus, he invites you not to perfection, not to happiness, but he invites you to meaning. Meaning that can't be taken away. That's what the writer of Hebrews was trying to express in chapter 12. And he says, therefore, since we're surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let's throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles. That's where Peter was. Peter was just caught up in the sin and the shame. He says, no, don't do that. Instead, run with perseverance the race marked out for us. Let's run it together. One of the great joys is running it together, running it together with this community. I gotta tell you, it's a joy how many years have we run this journey together? You're not as perfect as I am, but we've run this journey. We've, we've been in this journey for a long time. 30 years. 30 years. Seems like 100. <laughs> it seems like forever in a beautiful way. Yeah, yeah, I love you. Okay. But what a joy of serving Christ. You can be on your team, man. It's just, it's a joy when we follow Christ together. And there's so much meaning filled with this. And this leads me to, the, to my fifth principle that it's just made such a difference in my life. Jesus' call is simple. It's simple. You don't have to be brilliant. You really don't have to even have a normal IQ. And it applies to everyone. Follow me. Just follow me and keep following. Keep coming. Stay with me. I was thinking back to the dreams that Justin and I have for the Birmingham campus. It was just like the dreams that Mark and Dave and I and all that team, the bunch of us that were starting Kensington years ago. We just wanted to, we just wanted to build a place where people would know God loved them. And that Jesus Christ, that we believed Jesus Christ was alive and it was powerful to change lives. That's all we wanted to do. And as a result, man, we were, we were willing to give it all. Our spouses, our friends, people came. So many of you have can't come and thrown your life into this. I don't, think, I don't think we'll ever regret following Jesus to life. And I just want to say this personally. You can, Paula's here today. My wife's here today. You can ask her. I have an unbelievable pull towards comfort, towards being just kind of taking the easy road. And if it wasn't for the pull of accompanying Jesus, man, I think, 
I think I'd just sit in an overstuffed chair and please myself 24 hours a day. And so when Jesus calls me into adventure, I know I didn't want to go on this Navajo trip because we were going to sleep on, on uh, airbags. It was going to be 105 degrees. And I'm like, I'm 68 years old. I don't need to do this anymore. I feel like the Lord said, yeah, well, guess what? We got there. The, the men were in the, in the sanct- church sanctuary. The men were sleeping on airbags. They had one room with one bed. <laughs> Thank you very much. So my record of serving others, of not serving others, is still unbroken. And uh, it was just, just a great, great time. But Jesus invites us to throw off the old to toss the hindrances. That's what it means. Throw off everything. Toss it. Apotithemi is the Greek word. It means get rid of everything that's going to stop you from living a life with Jesus Christ. And I will say this. When you follow Jesus, there is joy. There is fun. There's great sorrow. Yeah, there's grief. There's pain. But it's so cool to know that Jesus is with you every step of the way. I just want to say this about Peter. Peter could easily have stepped back into his old life. And I have a lot of friends that have done that over the years. A lot of people have come and gone from their life, from their faith with Jesus to see him give up. But Peter didn't. He stepped back into the life Jesus prepared for him. And that life included eventual torture and execution. But Peter never looked back, as far as we know from that point. He considered it all worthwhile the last thing as I finish up, it says, Simon Peter, I've already read this once, but see it again. He climbed back into the boat and dragged the net ashore. It was full of large fish, but even with so many, the net was not torn. What does that mean? I think there was a principle that Jesus was saying, if we follow him, sometimes the challenges of what we face are going to feel overwhelming. Have you ever felt overwhelmed by the challenges of your life? I bet you have. You ever felt overwhelmed by your job situation, your finances, or your your health, or your love for your children, or broken relationships. Yes. But there's something about this. As Jesus says, with me, when you fish, and when you fish for people, and when when you follow me, and when you live a life of purpose, and you join in community with others, the nets are gonna hold. Nets are gonna hold. They're going to be able to hold the challenge. Is I'm going, to, I'm going to be there with you. And I think here's my last point. Jesus comes not just to mend what you were, but to move you to be more than you thought you could be. Make those nets way better, way stronger, way more purposeful. He comes not just to mend what you were, but to move you to be more than what you thought you could be. And I think that's true for every single person. Where is Jesus moving you? And so as we wrap up, as the band comes out, as I get ready to pray, I've just got a couple of questions I want you to think about. Number one, have you ever, is there anybody here who has not ever had the joy of intentionally saying to Jesus, I will accompany you. I will join you wherever you lead. That's what it means to be a follower of Jesus. That's what it means to to come to Jesus saying, Jesus is saying, come, I wrap my forgiveness, I wrap my love around you, and you just come and you surrender. You say, yeah, I'm going to accompany you. I'm going to say yes to your invitation. Second question is this. What does Jesus want to mend in your life? What's, man, where are the nets of your life torn today? And you just feel like you've been shredded. I'm sure there are a lot of you feeling that. Jesus Christ mends lives. And it's a lifelong process, believe me. The mending doesn't stop, does it? Hello? Anybody? I mean, the mending keeps going on because we are we're people that need mending and he keeps doing it. And then my last question is very simple. What's he calling you to? What's the invitation? Where's the investment of your life where you say, I want Jesus Christ to shine in my life and through my life. And Lord, where are you moving me? I'm hoping there are some people at Kenzie and are going to go, I think God is moving us to be a part of the Navajo movement in northeastern Arizona, up in the mountains. Be awesome. 
Maybe some of you, many of you here have felt the call to Hope Water. We've had some incredible moments in this church, this campus, of calling to Hope Water and the movement of, of all of this. It's simply this, that Jesus says, follow me. At the very end of this story, I don't have it in scripture, but Peter's asking about John. And John, he, Peter and John were always, they were, they were a pair. They were always in it together. And he goes, well, what about him? What's his deal? Jesus says, don't worry about him. You follow me. Simple. And I will say this, if you do, you'll find that there's no truer friend, no one who will love you more, no one who could actually fulfill the promise to say, I will be with you always, even to the very ends of the earth and the ends of the world. Let's pray together. Father, thank you. Thank you for beloved Peter. Love, love this man. Looking forward to meeting him in heaven. Just hopefully not too soon. But thank you that Peter's life is a shining picture of failure doesn't stop us. It's not, it's not the final word. And we don't need fear of it to keep us from following you. Thank you for this incredible image of us kind of running back to what is familiar to our old ways. And there you are on the shore and you've made us a meal. You're not coercing anybody. You're just saying, hey, come and, come and have breakfast with me. I've thought enough about you to cook you breakfast. I love you. This is such an image, unexpected, of what we never ever thought the love of God would look like. We thought the love of God would look like crashing clouds and thunder and mountains falling in the ocean. And here, here, is, here you are, the risen Jesus, simply saying, hey, I've got a nice fire going here and some bread and some fish. And I wanna do it with you. Lord, let that be true for my brothers and sisters here and for believers around the world. And for those that are searching for meaning, might they hear your voice, Jesus calling them from the shore to come home. In Jesus' name, amen. If you're able, will you stand and sing with us?
Thank you for that love that never gives up on us, that is constantly pursuing us and chasing us down, that fights until we are found, that we are back in your arms. Jesus, we are so grateful for your love. We are so grateful for your mercy and compassion towards us, that you are the God who gives countless second chances and an opportunity for us to start again. Jesus, we love you. In your name we pray, amen. Amen. Well, thank you so much for joining us this Sunday. We hope we see you back here next week. We're continuing our summer series lessons at the lake. But have a great rest of your Sunday. If you're a young adult, come to the Ferndale Project, have lunch with us. If not, hang out in the lobby outside, and we'll see you back here next week. <laughs>